Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Overcoming AI SOC Design Challenges. I'm Sohail, and I will be your moderator today. Just a few notes before we begin. You can participate in the Q&A session by clicking on the Questions tab and typing in your questions in the text area, and then click, clicking the Submit button. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can during the time that we have at the end of today's presentation. But if we don't get to your questions today, someone will get back to you after the webinar is over. You can also use the Questions tab to let us know if you're experiencing any technical issues. Make sure your speakers are turned up, and we also recommend that you disable your computer's pop-up blockers. Lastly, please note that the archived webinar will be available right after today's live session. You will receive an email with the link to the archived webinar. And now on to the presentation. Discussing, discussing today's topic is Ron Lohman. Ron is the Technical Marketing Manager for IoT and AI at Synopsys. Prior to joining Synopsys, Ron spent 16 years at Freescale within their MCU division. His background includes stints in strategy, business development, product marketing, and engineering roles supporting IC tests for automotive engine controllers and factory automation and controls design. Without further ado, here is Ron. Thank you. So with that, I think we'll just start out with the agenda today. There's lots of different uh, topics we're going to cover. Um, we're first going to just look at the AI market in, in general and uh, what AI is and what's occurring in the, in the space. And then we'll dive into some of the key deep learning SOC challenges. And those mainly are around the processing, the memory, the connectivity, and the security. Uh, we'll wrap up with a summary, and hopefully this will be a very informative session for you. So the first thing is really to define what AI is, and there's quite a few definitions out there. AI in general is a very broad term. It, it can mean anything that mimics human behavior. It's been discussed uh, for hundreds of years. Um, but of course, today's world, it, it means something quite different. And if you look at subsets of AI, in particular machine learning, this is uh, something that uses advanced statistical algorithms to improve artificial intelligence. And so these things can be as simple as linear regression, or they can be as complex as neural networks. And neural networks is actually a, a subset of machine learning. And this is where we see most of the uh, development and investment today uh, by companies. So um, an example of, of deep learning are algorithms that have hidden layers. And the most common are the convolutional neural network and the recurrent neural network. And this is where a lot of the development, the R&D from uh, industry and, and education uh, is found today. Um, so again, neural networks uh, are a subset of, of uh, machine learning. And uh, CNN and RNN are, are some of the main topics of today. Um, so let's look at the history a little bit. Uh, if you look at uh, 2010 and 2011, uh, you can see that we've labeled these um, uh, algorithms being used uh, as um, shallow learning. Uh, what actually was used here was um, support vector machines. And this particular graph shows the results of a uh, visual recognition challenge called ImageNet. And ImageNet is a large database of, of pictures that uh, uh, AI, was, uh, AI algorithms were used to uh, identify objects. In 2012, uh, there was um, uh, an advancement made um, where a convolutional neural network was used um, combined on an NVIDIA uh, GPU processor uh, that significantly improved the error of the object identification. Um, since that time, CNNs have been used uh, pervasively for, for vision systems. Um, and by 2015, you can see that the, the error rate is actually lower than the human error for object identification. So this has really progressed the industry dramatically uh, and played a big role. So it's not just um, the processors, uh, but also the AI algorithms that are developing rather quickly and playing an important role in the investment uh, moving forward. So I always uh, think this is a very interesting um, innovation that we've seen over the, the past uh, few years, and, and uh, it really starts an exciting new market. So if you look at AI as a market, um, what you see is the fact that uh, 
uh, deep learning in particular is being implemented across all markets. It's not necessarily a market in and of itself. Um, we're seeing AI or deep learning capabilities being added to chipsets uh, in every space. Um, if you look at the mobile market, um, all premier smartphones um, already have or will have uh, deep learning processing capabilities by 2021. Uh, in, in the data center, more than 50% of enterprises will deploy AI accelerators in their server infrastructure by 2022. Of course, autonomous vehicles are intended to go into production by 2020. And then in the IoT space where you see voice recognition systems already on the market, more than 20% of all those devices will have AI processing capabilities. Uh, this graph actually shows the growth in both discrete devices as well as integrated devices. And when we define discrete devices, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have any processor. It just means that it's a, a separate acceleration uh, unit from the main um, CPU or main uh, host processor. But you can see that most of this development uh, or AI functionality or deep learning functionality is being integrated into the main chipset in many of these uh, markets and will continue to do so. And this is where we'll see a lot of the growth moving forward. So there are many types of deep learning applications. Um, this shows uh, six distinct um, subgroups, um, but there are more. Uh, the data center, of course, is a very important one. This is where most of the training occurs for AI algorithms uh, related to neural network um, capabilities. And this could be anywhere from financial data to marketing data, um, vision data, um, very advanced medical um, recognition data, uh, all sorts of different um, uh, large data sets that can identify patterns that humans cannot. So neural networks are being used very effectively in that space. Of course, in the automotive space, um, uh, autonomous vehicles are using the technology for navigation. Uh, drones are using similar technologies. For vision systems, for cameras, object identification uh, is very important for identifying different types of objects, uh, facial detection, and so on. Um, in the IoT space, you have natural language understanding, so it's not a fact of just recognizing what was said, but actually trying to formulate a, a response. Um, so very, uh, um, very intelligent systems are being used for that, both in the data center and at the edge. Uh, context awareness is being used to understand uh, human activity, uh, what somebody is doing if they're running or moving or getting in and out of a car to provide better services, um, potentially on your, your phone or your mobile device. And then uh, 5G itself is a very complex implementation of communications and having the ability to recognize uh, the most efficient um, communication um, paths is very important. Uh, 5G self-organization uh, is, is is, can use neural networks very effectively. So there's many different applications from cloud to edge and, and you're seeing this across, the, across the, the board. So let's look a little closer at the AI programming model, in particular for deep learning. Um, if you look at the bottom left, um, there's a term called the initial graph, and, and that's typically your AI model. There's a lot of AI models on the market that are available um, for free, and uh, some of the examples are, are YOLO, ResNet, SegNet, GoogleNet, uh, AlexNet was the one uh, I showed a couple slides earlier um, used in the ImageNet um, challenge. Um, these uh, mathematical models uh, are an important starting point uh, to develop um, for uh, AI inference. Um, but first you need to train these graphs. And to train those, large databases are used. So in particular on the ImageNet challenge, that is a large database of, of images. Uh, but there's many others out there. There's specific ones for identifying cats or fashion or all kinds of different things you want to train your algorithm for. Um, as far as tools being used to train these, there's a, there's a couple popular tools out there. Uh, Google and Facebook and Amazon all have um, different tools. Um, Google's TensorFlow has been one of the more popular versions of these tools. And they take the uh, image database as well as the initial graph uh, and are able to um, uh, train uh, the final graphs and spit out um, both the final graph and all the weights and coefficients that are required um, for that trained model. Once you have a trained model, you can begin inference. And typically inference, uh, it can happen in the data center very effectively for large data sets. Um, but a lot of times at the edge, there's more constrained devices from a semiconductor perspective. Uh, that need to handle these types of final graphs and weights. And so um, they sometimes will be compressed. Um, other times they will not be. But then 
new inputs can be uh, um, calculated, like a new image or a new voice um, uh, command uh, can be taken and, and uh, patterns can be recognized to take action on. So this is kind of a, a model of, of uh, how the programming model works and, and gives you kind of a, a basic understanding. And this is important with respect to understanding how the math will work and how it has an impact in the overall, overall SOC design. So let's take a very simple example. Um, this particular slide shows four different, uh, three different inputs and four different scenarios with known outputs. And so this is what would be similar to a uh, known database, like the ImageNet database that I showed before, where you actually know what the object is um, and you need to train an uh, AI model or uh, AI algorithm. And this is showing a, a very simple set of, of three inputs and the known outputs. What happens in these, um, when you train these devices is um, based on the inputs and uh, weights, you get a, 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 an output based on the, the AI graph, and then that's fed into an um, error um, estimation uh, with a known correct answer and fed back into the calculation of the weights. And this is what we call training. So this is done iteratively over and over again. Um, and uh, the next slide actually shows um, an example of this very simple uh, set of, of, of known uh, inputs and known outputs uh, with a starting weight. And over 126 iterations, it's very easy to tell, because it's a simple model, that uh, input one played the dominant role on what the output would be. And so this is how these algorithms are trained. Um, and you can see the weight uh, becomes much more important for that first input than the other two uh, uh, inputs into what the output will be. So um, what happens over time after 126 iterations is you can actually get uh, um, an accuracy of how um, accurate of identification of the result would be. And th in this case, it's 95%. Um, of course, with better guesses uh, come with each iteration. So over time, your accuracy will improve until it levels off. Um, with so many iterations. This is, again, a, a very simple example of how the math works. Um, and the reason I'm showing you this is because uh, it really kind of gives you some appreciation for the amount of processing that's required. And this is one of the main challenges for SOC development because the processing requirements uh, in these examples have in increased dramatically from traditional uh, SOCs. Um, so, for instance, for training, in this particular very simple example, um, 12 multiplies plus 8 accumulations times 126 training cycles equals over 2,500 op uh, operations. So training is a very in process intensive activity. Um, even inference, uh, it's much, much less operations than the training, uh, but it still is, is a significant amount of training. And this is why uh, specialized processors are being developed to handle neural networks. Um, and this is, a, again, a very simple example. So let's, let's take a look uh, at a more complex example. So um, uh, what about a deep neural network? Uh, this example actually is Google's LSTM1 voice recognition model. Um, so let's say, uh, hey, Google, how can Synopsys IP help me with my AI design? And let's look at the processing required um, for something like this. Well, based on uh, what would be needed, this requires over 56 layers and over 34 million weights. So that's over 19 billion operations per guess. So however many iterations you need to do to train this model, uh, the, the amount of compute capability is tremendous. And this is causing a major challenge in the industry today. Um, you know, GPUs have made a major step forward, and you saw that in the graph I showed earlier in 2012. Uh, on how effective those would be. But even then, that took over a week to train uh, the data set. Um, uh, and so there's always a balance on um, power and, and compute capability and costs, um, as well as training time on uh, implementing these neural network algorithms. So this gives you a little bit of appreciation for, for what it would take. So let's really dive into the SOC itself. Because the processing capabilities and uh, uh, required for this, it really puts um, three major challenges from an SOC architecture standpoint. And the first one's around processing. And so I talked about the neural network uh, processing. That requires massively parallel matrix multiplications. Um, and, and so usually specialized processors are, are really more effective in handling that. 
uh, even more so than, than uh, GPUs today, and, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, but it's also a factor of, of heterogeneous processing. And so it's not just the neural network processing that's required, but there's also scalar and vector DSP capabilities for pre-processing of the data, post-decision-making of the data that, re that requires a, um, uh, really a heterogeneous design. Um, the last piece is, uh, of course, in the data center, you have many more resources with respect to uh, processing capability uh, and memory capabilities. Um, on the edge, we want to compress these models to reduce those, uh, um, those resources. And so uh, techniques of compression uh, are done to fit these algorithms into edge devices. And, and some of those techniques are called pruning and quantization. Um, so pruning is the activity of, of removing certain layers to, to remove the amount of compute capabilities. And quantization is um, changing the math from, let's say, 32-bit floating point down to an 8-bit integer. Um, but what this does is it increases the irregular compute intensity and the irregular memory accesses. So our customers are, are having to, to design very uh, innovative uh, architectures to handle these types of um, uh, changes in, in, in how the neural networks uh, need to perform. So this is really the first challenge that I wanted to identify. Um, again, it's really three different pieces, the scalar, vector DSP, and specialized processing that's required. This particular example is, is showing um, the different stages of an embedded vision solution. Uh, and of course, this is related to the Synopsys EV vision processor and, and why we've developed what we have. Um, so there's the pre-processing, which requires more simple data level parallelism. There's the more complex data level parallelism with the selected areas of interest, as well as the precise processing of select areas. And this is where the CNN engine does its work. So for object identification, object recognition, uh, this is, is where it plays a role. Um, there's also, um, uh, and, and you can see that highlighted here um, in red, um, there's also for recurrent neural networks, recurrent neural networks actually have a function that uh, understands time. And for voice applications or motion analysis, uh, this is something that's required. Um, but again, there's different um, uh, activities that, that need to be processed. Um, so it's not just the neural network matrix multiplication. There's the pre-processing and decision-making that requires the, the other heterogeneous processing. And, and this is kind of the key point on this slide. So let's discuss uh, the Synopsys Embedded Vision Processor. So this is a heterogeneous compute uh, solution with a specific convolutional neural network. And so um, it actually uh, includes the 32-bit unified scalar processing. It has the vector DSP uh, up to 64 max per cycle per CPU. And you can see in the, the picture over here on the right that uh, you have the capability of, of instantiating four different cores. And then it has the high-performance uh, CNN up to over 3,500 max um, uh, of performance. We also support all the leading CNN graphs. And so uh, again, this goes back to some of the examples I gave earlier on YOLO, GoogleNet, ResNet. We do support those. Um, and of course, we support custom uh, graphs that the customers may be developing. Um, we have a, a very um, uh, open uh, uh, programming model supporting OpenCV libraries, the OpenVX framework. Um, we have our own CNN mapping tool, which is very critical. And uh, we support the major frameworks. So I talked about uh, TensorFlow and um, uh, CAFE2. Uh, there's an effort in the industry to um, uh, consolidate all the, the different frameworks, and, and that uh, effort's called ONNX, um, and, and we are supporting that as well. And then the last piece is because automotive is such an important piece of the overall uh, AI market, uh, we actually have our uh, embedded vision processor um, ready for the highest level of automotive safety readiness. So this includes ISO 26262, ASIL D ready. Um, and so, of course, we have the documentation and all the features needed for safety applications. Um, beyond our EV processors, we have many other different processor um, solutions. Um, but I want to kind of touch uh, on what we're trying to solve. So if you look at the graph here, or the bar chart, this is actually an example of a HAR stands for human activity recognition. So this is kind of a context awareness type application where you do some sort of 9D fusion um, processing of, of, an, uh, of sensor data. 
Um, and then you do a neural network object identification type uh, 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 processing um, method to identify what's going on uh, in the world around us or, or for whoever you're, you're monitoring. Um, the purple actually shows, uh, this is basically a graph of different math primitives. The purple is identifying a math primitive called dot, ma dot product, which is basically a vector, uh, ve vector multiplication. Uh, but you can see how this is a dominant uh, math function that's performed over and over and over again. And this kind of shows the requirement for the, the matrix multiplication that's required in these neural networks. Um, and so what I'm pointing out here is that dot product is a key operation for, for CNN, RNN, even support vector machines uh, and more. And dot product computations, they'll grow quadratically with the model size. So uh, over time, we've seen AI model size uh, increase uh, because they're trying to make them more sophisticated to uh, increase the accuracy uh, of these models. Um, and from a solution standpoint, uh, Synopsys supports ARC processors. It's the second most pervasive processor architecture, so it can support a lot of the scalar vector DSP capabilities. But we also have the ability to uh, build Apex extensions. So if you want to build custom instructions to handle things such as dot product, uh, you can do that with, with these types of um, uh, processor solutions. Uh, we also have the ability with ARC to tightly couple memories. Um, and this gets, it will get to my next point here, but this is a really critical um, uh, feature because um, a lot of times neural networks are trying to replicate what the brain does. And the brain's extremely efficient, one, because the memory and the processing is built together. And so a lot of new computer architectures are attempting to try to do that. Uh, being able to tightly coupled memories um, with our processors uh, can lend uh, to, to improvements in, in these types of, of functions. Um, last but not least, we do have uh, other solutions. Um, so again, I'm talking about the dominant primitive such as dot, dot product. We've, we've, we've uh, been very successful at selling our foundation cores, which are primitive math functions that customers will use to build their own neural network processors. Um, as well as some of these uh, primitives uh, within our logic library. So we've been able to, to do some very unique things with many of our different solutions around processing from logic libraries, foundation cores, our ARC processors and custom instructions, um, and of course our EV uh, complete heterogeneous processing solutions. But let's move a little deeper. So a lot of customers like to design their own accelerator. They know their algorithm best. They understand how they want to design these things. Um, and so they want to build their own uh, deep learning accelerator. We have an industry leading tool called ASIP Designer. Uh, it's fully programmable to build your own processor and accelerator. Um, it's highly uh, um, it, it paralyzed uh, hardware. So it, it's, it's great at, at developing um, new hardware for, for uh, massive parallelism, which you would need for neural networks. Um, it also has custom data paths, so you can optimize uh, those data flows. Um, and this example on the right is an example from a um, uh, cellular uh, solution, but it really gets to the point on, on why ASIP Designer can be so effective. So at the bottom here, uh, we're highlighting three different math functions. On the right, we're highlighting um, a configuration of gates that describe all three of those uh, math functions with different data flows. So having a, a programmable, flexible data flow uh, we're able to design a very optimized uh, number of gates um, to represent these math functions. And so building your own networks uh, or neural networks, uh, you can leverage the same capabilities with our ASIP designer, um, and, it, and this is why it's been so effective. Um, and it, it's been popular for, for audio applications and, and many other applications before neural networks, and now it's, it's uh, really um, uh, helping customers build uh, uh, those. Um, so that summarizes the, the specialized processing um, that we've seen from a challenge um, perspective. But one of the, the major um, things that we're seeing is, is memory performance. Um, because uh, we have to access so many weights, and this goes back to the initial slides I had on uh, these weights or coefficients uh, need to be accessed by the processor um, often. And uh, so, and then there's a lot of them. So you remember the, the number over 19 billion um, operations. Uh, you can just imagine that, and 34 million um, uh, weights. Um, so this really is pushing the limitations on memory capacity as well as bandwidth. Um, the other piece 
uh, of the challenge is cash coherency. So I talked about this being a heterogeneous um, uh, requirement from uh, solving neural networks. It's not just the, the neural network accelerator. There's the vector DSP and, and scalar capabilities. Um, and then the advanced processes um, are really being selected by our customers for a couple reasons. Of course, FinFET technologies are very important for lowering power, uh, but they're also trying to maximize the high-density SRAM to, re to reduce the amount of data movement on chip. Uh, that both reduces power consumption and costs of the overall solution. So if you look at uh, the rise of neural networks, a lot of the activity is trying to um, replicate what a brain does. And of course, a brain is highly effective at doing this. And, and, uh, but the, the key thing here is that um, you really look at trying to move these coefficients or weights back and forth from memory to the processor. And a lot of times, doing that activity can consume 10x the energy uh, just to move the data to the, the Mac operation. Uh, it can be 10x more power than, than actually performing the calculation itself. So um, memory architectures are becoming a, a very critical piece of the overall uh, design implementation for AI chipsets. And this graph actually shows this very effectively. Uh, if you look at Moore's Law over time, memory performance specifically to off-chip DRAM uh, hasn't kept up with the advances in CPU performance uh, as uh, year over year. And that gap is, is over 50% per year. Um, so we already have a problem before we even uh, look at neural network capabilities. Uh, GPU performance, uh, of course, for neural networks because of the matrix um, uh, uh, capabilities of those processors, actually accentuates the gap um, of GPU performance versus access to memory. Um, so it's gotten worse um, with the advent of GPU capabilities that are during neural networks. And now we have a lot of uh, development on custom deep learning activities where um, these processors are sometimes uh, the claims are over 100 times more uh, effective or higher performance than existing GPUs. So, you know, looking back at the NVIDIA 2012 um, uh, advancement of, of uh, the ImageNet competition, um, the GPU was great and was able to reduce uh, training time to uh, under a week. Um, now we're seeing uh, deep learning specific processors uh, reduce that even more um, and being able to handle much more complex um, neural networks. Um, but what it's doing is it's, it's pushing the envelope on increasing the memory performance gap. So a lot of these uh, architectures, the goal is to reduce the data movement. So they're, they're really trying to use innovative heterogeneous memory architectures. It's not just a heterogeneous processing architecture, but it's memory architectures as well. And Synopsys provides a lot of solutions um, from on-chip memory compilers with, with tons of different options to very high bandwidth HBM2 um, uh, solutions. And these are effective for a lot of AI chipsets that are being implemented and, and uh, going into production today. So let's take a look at the different memory options, specifically off-chip. I've highlighted five different options here from LPDDR5, uh, DDR4, 5, HBM2, and two versions of GDR. Uh, if you look at the data center, um, because we're using much more complex math, much larger data sets, and you have a lot more resources from a processing perspective, uh, bandwidth is the primary um, constraint that we see. And so HBM2 has, uh, provides a, a very high bandwidth um, interface. And uh, customers are adopting uh, HBM2. In fact, you see two instantiations many times of HBM2 interfaces. And they're always pushing the envelope to get more, because more bandwidth is, is required for these applications. Um, but there's another aspect to HBM2 and why it's so popular in the data center chipset implementation. And it's because of the power consumption. Because it has high bandwidth and high parallelism, you get a very low picojoule per bit. And this is actually uh, a very important aspect power consumption is playing a bigger role in the overall chip design for data center chips um, and, and how it plays a role with respect to neural network deep learning applications. Um, now for edge devices, we're still going to see uh, traditional um, architectures or uh, memory interfaces. Specifically, LPDDR is still going to be used in the mobile chipsets. It's still going to be used in automotive chipsets. And a lot of it has to do with power consumption. And so the interface IP is, is playing a big role there. 
um, as, as well as costs and, and overall um, uh, industry adoption of, of these solutions. Um, DDR4 and 5, so there is a push to, to move to um, some of the, the latest standards there, um, specific to memory and all, all, uh, memory capacity. And, and I'll touch on that in the next slide here. But you can kind of see there's many different options. Um, and depending on what type of chipset's being developed, for data center, it's HBM2. For auto and mobile and consumer applications, it's, it's more of traditional LPDDR uh, and DDR solutions. So let's look at, at why uh, the data center is needing high bandwidth. So if you look at a, a, uh, an AI model, this is VGG16. This is a, a more legacy model, but it just uh, does give us some appreciation of the amount of memory required. We talked about it, the amount of coefficients, the amount of uh, operations required, and of course that translates directly into the amount of memory required. So VGG16 to train that data requires up to 9 gigabytes. These models over time have become more complex, and so 16 represents the number of hidden layers in that AI model. Uh, but VGG 516 actually exists, and you can tell that uh, uh, the amount of memory required to train these types of applications has grown significantly. So in this case, it's 83 gigabytes. And of course, on the uh, interface, the inference model, it's much less. So it's about uh, half a gig, um, and then. The particular model can be compressed. So these things can be compressed into some uh, very small um, uh, in optimized inference model. Um, but what's critical here is when you compress it again, it uh, increases the irregular access to memory, the irregular compute intensities. And so um, this plays a role in the overall architecture on how to access the weights when and where in the system. Um, on the data center, I talked about HBM2 is being adopted for optimal picojoules per bit and high bandwidth. For capacity, DDR will also be on these systems as, as well, in addition to HBM2 in some cases. Um, cache coherency is playing a big role, so for um, uh, AI accelerators, uh, C6 for heterogeneous processing uh, is required, and if you're not familiar with C6 or CCIX, um, that is a uh, cache coherent um, interconnect that is based on PCIe, and we're seeing adoption in the market for this. Um, On-chip memory is increasingly important, so optimized memory compilers for high-performance compute of AI processing uh, for reduced area for large arrays because the capacity for the memory requirements are so large and you want to tightly couple these memories where possible to the processors, large arrays are a lot of times required, but also low-power compilers. So there's a lot of different needs from a memory compiler standpoint. Um, on the edge, it's a little bit different. Um, of course, the LPDDR and, and future LPDDR5 are, are being um, adopted. Um, On-chip memory is, is very important. We have special cells for low-power math on our logic libraries. We support near-threshold voltage cells. So for the very com uh, highly compressed small AI algorithms for IoT, for let's say context resolution or, or voice recognition, um, low-power uh, near-threshold voltages can be used. Um, we have uh, HPC kits for embedded vision processors, um, and you can see the why um, from a power standpoint you want to uh, uh, try to build the model in embedded SRAM um, by the, the numbers I've shown here on the bottom left. So we do have specialized deep learning foundation IP. Um, specific, this specific example is at 7 nanometer. I talked about some of the things that we provide. Um, we provide special cells for low power dot product implementations, near threshold voltage cells. TCAMs have become almost um, required for a lot of AI chipsets anymore. Addressable memory, uh, again, is, is very important uh, in uh, accessing the right um, data uh, at the right time uh, without having to uh, uh, spend a lot of um, uh, cycles to, to access that data. Um, specific uh, analysis for, for large SRAM contents are, are very valuable for our customers. Uh, we have specialized uh, high-performance compute kits for our, our ARC EV processors. Um, of course, uh, dynamic power and, and, and uh, area reductions are, are incredibly important, and we have tools to help with that. Um, we're really a one-stop shop with optimal uh, uh, or, or uh, uh, best power performance and area targets. Um, the other piece here is that we do have a wide variety of different options. So we have high speed, high density, ultra high density solutions, uh, via ROMs. Uh, having all these different um, options uh, available 
is really advantageous for our, our customers because they can design a very um, uh, heterogeneous memory architecture with these different options. And then the last challenge is really around the real-time connectivity. So once the, the neural network or deep, uh, deep learning um, model is um, trained, uh, of course we have to get new data to the, the neural networks. And, and you need reliable connectivity um, both to the data centers as well as from the sensors uh, or, or audio to the real-time interfaces. Um, and of course, uh, reduced energy uh, via uh, power management features and FinFET technologies are, are very important here. So if you look a little bit at, closer at the different edge inference um, uh, applications, uh, of course, for cloud connectivity, we provide Ethernet and CERTI solutions. For chip-to-chip -chip connectivity, PCIe and C6 uh, are available. For super image resolution, for digital televisions, um, USB embedded display port and HDMI solutions are being adopted. For audio, of course, we have uh, USB and, and standard um, connectivity for microphones and speakers. Uh, we also have complete subsystems related to our ARC uh, data fusion uh, IP. Um, and, and again, this promotes tightly coupled memories and tightly coupled peripherals uh, to reduce overall latency of the system, as well as uh, options for, for uh, acceleration. Um, Memory performance, we have lots of different interfaces from HVM2 to DDR, LPDDR, and of course our embedded memory compilers and logic libraries. Um, from a vision standpoint, uh, MIPI has played a critical role for connectivity to CMOS image sensors, and we provide complete solutions regarding that. And then of course other sensor connectivity such as MIPI I3C has become very prevalent in the market. And so there's lots of different edge connectivity that's required, and, and Synopsys provides a full portfolio. So this particular graph is, or, or slide is really an example of a camera and sensor connectivity for vision system. And it's really highlighting our MIPI CSI2 and I3C solutions. Um, we support an, an enhanced color depth using RAW 16 or 20 formats for, vision, uh, for machine vision. Uh, we support virtual channels to accommodate uh, a larger number of, of sensors. And you're seeing that in the market. You're seeing more and more sensors being um, uh, implemented into the system. Uh, and we also showcase our, our I3C in this system. So both the MIPI interfaces and I3C systems are being used in these types of, of connectivity. Uh, you see the image sensor um, uh, die uh, highlighted on the, the left. And on the right, you see more of the application processor that would include the neural network capability. Um, everything in purple are blocks that are provided from Synopsys, from the MIPI CSI2 and DFIs to the LPDDR4, to the Ethernet, and all the different processors that are required. Our ASIP designer is ideal for ISP processor design. Uh, we have our ARC EV processor, and then of course our, our ARC DSP and, and uh, uh, applications processors that are available. Um, so this really shows a complete camera system uh, and shows all the different options that Synopsys has for you. So let me touch on the the last uh, challenge, but one that's incredibly important. So security is uh, something that's always discussed, but for AI, there's really three pieces on why security is so important. The first one is AI models are very expensive to develop. Um, so protecting that IP is, is, is becoming paramount for, for our customers. This is where they feel their key differentiation is a lot of times. It's either in the algorithm, the development of the algorithm, the training of the algorithm. So it really needs to be secured. The next piece is a lot of these AI algorithms use private data. And so this could be for facial recognition or bio, uh, biometrics for fingerprints or uh, other types of, of personal data that you really don't want stolen. Uh, once that, I, uh, those things are stolen, of course, um, uh, you see it every day uh, on, for credit cards uh, being stolen and that personal information being used. Um, uh, of course, I have uh, uh, used it in a bad, bad manner. Um, the, other, the last piece is really the integrity of the model. So once AI models are trained, uh, once they're developed, you don't want any, any um, corruption of that data. Um, there's examples where corruption of facial recognition data can really throw off uh, what those images look like. 
Um, your accuracy can, can really be reduced to almost nothing uh, if the data is corrupted. Because um, you, you can imagine if some of these weights in the example I showed above were changed, if, if that were to happen, um, basically it could make very uh, wrong decisions, especially in applications like automotive or, or um, other uh, life safety applications. Uh, so what Synopsys provides is uh, complete um, uh, secure enclaves through our uh, T-Root um, uh, subsystems. Uh, the picture on the right shows uh, how our subsystem can secure the entire um, trusted execution environment. Um, including the CPUs and, and processors used for neural networks. And so, again, security is a very important aspect of the overall design, and increasingly, to protect AI, it's going to become uh, critical. So beyond the IP itself and the challenges that Synopsys sees, uh, Synopsys has a, has a, a broad experience in uh, developing uh, AI chipsets. Um, so we offer um, services. We have a deep knowledge in AI frameworks, um, AI uh, graphs. Uh, we have expertise in graph compression. And the mapping tools are becoming uh, more and more important on, on how to optimize these systems. Um, of course, we have uh, leading class um, processor capabilities um, and processor IP and software. Uh, we have mastery of, of key, key uh, memory connectivity as well as other interface IP. Um, we understand low power strategies. Um, we work with customers on PPA estimations for their IP. Um, we help them explore memory architectures, uh, latencies, bus bandwidth, um, uh, as well as provide services uh, and solutions around verification and FPGA uh, prototyping. Um, so we have a, a lot of different things above and beyond the IP uh, that we work with customers on. Um, and and uh, uh, this is becoming a more critical component with respect to AI. Here's a little bit more specifics around this. Um, so for verification, emulation, and prototyping, we have Zebu and HAPS uh, systems that can be used for SOC verification, software development and bring up, hybrid emulation, power and performance analysis, and AI benchmarks. We also have a tool called Platform Architect that's used for architectural exploration. And uh, again, I, all the issues that I talked about, by, about heterogeneous compute, heterogeneous memory architectures, Something like this tool can be very valuable in, in evaluating how to optimize your SOC architecture. And then beyond that, we have services. We provide services for architectural trade-offs, IP subsystems. Uh, I talked about our ASAP designer tool, and, and uh, we help customers with this. System verification and early software development. So in summary, from a design IP perspective for AI, we have a complete portfolio uh, from processors, um, including uh, our, our uh, completely um, integrated EV uh, processors that include the Scalar Vector DSP and CNN uh, engines. We have ARC processors that uh, can assist um, uh, some of the other processing that's required. Uh, beyond the neural network um, processing. We have foundation cores for uh, deep learning primitives, and we have our ASIP designer tool for those developing their own uh, accelerators. Um, we have memories and logic libraries that have some key features, including near threshold, uh, TCAMs, uh, supporting large arrays, and so on. Uh, we have all the, the memory, uh, different types of, of memory interfaces, including HBM2, DDR, LPDDR, we have the chip-to-chip -chip, uh, solutions. Um, C6 provides cache coherency. We have cloud connectivity for Ethernet, uh, including high-speed CERTES. Um, MIPI, of course, plays a, a large role in sensor inputs, for, specifically for vision, uh, and HDMI and USB for video inputs, uh, and a lot of other solutions around sensors. So it's a complete portfolio addressing really the main challenges that we see from an SOC architecture standpoint for our customers. So in summary, um, SOC development for AI applications uh, are seeing broad adoption across the board. We're seeing it in every market. Um, it's not uh, um, restricted to specific markets. It's across the board. Um, these types of applications require deep neural network processing capabilities that are being added. Um, one of the key uh, constraints is really around memories and access to memories. Uh, be it bandwidth, capacity, uh, tightly coupled capabilities. Uh, we provide solutions there. Um, we have interface IP that's critical for real-time data connectivity. 
And then, of course, we're pushing the envelope on the latest and greatest process technologies. FinFETs are playing a big role in this. In particular, we see a lot of adoption at 7 nanometer, as well as implementing uh, a lot of power, uh, low power um, uh, features in our IP itself for sleep modes and, and so on. So all of these things together provide a, a great set of solutions to help customers develop their next generation uh, SOC for AI. So with that, I'd like to say thank you guys for attending. And at this point, we'd um, pass over to Sahail. Thank you, Ron. <clears throat> yes, so let's now move on to the question and answer portion of the webinar. To ask a question, click on the tab, the questions tab, and type in your question in the text box. And don't forget to click the submit button. Uh, as a uh, quick reminder, uh, don't forget, if, if we don't get to your questions today, we'll definitely get back to you after the, uh, the webinar is over. Our first, qu our first question is, what is the typical power or power range for AI training and inference chips? Yeah, this is a common question that we get. Um, it's really across the board. So for low power IoT devices, we're seeing milliwatt ranges. And these are for highly compressed AI algorithms. Um, in the data center, um, we're seeing you know, hundreds of watts for some of these solutions. And, and granted, it's a combination of, of many different processors sometimes uh, because how the architecture is designed on a system level. Um, but there are um, market reports stating data centers will take up to 20% of, of all power consumption um, by 2030 or 2035. Um, so it, it's becoming a really big issue on how to reduce overall power consumption. Um, but it's across the board, and it depends on the market you're really you're really targeting. But power is a, a big uh, factor, and of course, all these designs are are looking to reduce that. All right. <clears throat> the next question is: Why is interface IP a concern? Isn't processing the biggest issue? Yeah. So processing is one of the biggest issues. It's probably the most common. Um, question that, that we get around it. But interface IP is playing a, a pivoted role in this, um, both from uh, a system standpoint, uh, because you need reliable um, solutions um, that, that they know work. Um, what Synopsys does is, is we're very successful at, at providing interface IP to these designs. And, and customers really want to focus on what they're going to differentiate on. And so we're really providing all the pieces that, that they don't have to worry about. And you know, it does play a big role in the overall architecture with respect to the reliability, first-time success. Uh, it plays a role in the power consumption of their overall system. There's a lot of aspects of the interface IP that play a very important role uh, that Synopsys is able to provide for our customers. They can focus on what they are, are differentiating on. Great. Uh, next question is, is, uh, is CNN find its application for only classification segmentation aspects? Uh, no. CNN provides um, solutions beyond those uh, aspects. In fact, it, it provides a lot of solutions beyond just vision. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, really, uh, provide, it's really being used all over the map. Um, I don't get all the exposure to uh, what it's being used for, but you know, if you do some simple searches out there, it's well beyond um, uh, just those two aspects of the uh, um, functions. All right. Uh, next question is, uh, how is ma mask data handled? Mask data is handled. I'm not sure if I quite understand the question. Um, Okay, we can take that offline if you like. Yeah. And respond directly to the uh, the person that asked the question. Uh, I have one more question. Um, what are the typical clock frequencies seen in AI SOCs, and what is the trend? Yeah. Oh, actually, great question. Um, I hadn't really thought about it on the low end. Um, clock frequencies on you know small IoT devices can be rather rather low. Right, um, with major compression in these algorithms, if you're doing just object identification, let's say a license plate ap application, the clock frequency can be quite low in the tens of megahertz. Um, in the data center, there are targets that we see that are, are quite common in the one to one and a half gigahertz range. Um, but you know, it's really all over the map uh, depending on the application. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Ron. Uh, we have. One more question. Uh, what are the verification challenges in AI SOCs? 
So <laughs> I'm going to have to probably pass on that one. I'm not a verification expert. Um, uh, we do have a, I'm with our solutions group that pr promotes our um, uh, IP portfolio. Um, but I'd be happy to get uh, anybody that's interested in touch with our VG group um, and DG groups to, to help answer those questions as they're looking very closely at all this market and they've helped uh, put together some of this material and, and, and we are working closely together. So, All right, Ron. Uh, with that, I would like to bring the uh, webinar to a close. Thank you all for attending. Again, you will get an email with the uh, link to the archive webinar. And um, if you have any questions or need more information, please visit our uh, AI webpage, synopsis.com slash IP-AI. Thank you so much.